After Heme dismissed his class, news of what I had done spread through the university like wildfire. I guessed from the students' reactions that Master Heme was not particularly well loved. As I sat on a stone bench outside the mews, passing students smiled in my direction. Others waved or gave laughing thumbs up. While I enjoyed the notoriety, a cold anxiety was slowly growing in my gut. I'd made an enemy of one of the Nine Masters. I needed to know how much trouble I was in. Dinner in the mess was brown bread with butter, stew, and beans. A manette was there, his wild hair making him look like a great white wolf. Simon and Sovoy groused idly about the food, making grim speculations as to what manner of meat was in the stew. To me, less than a span away from the streets of Tarbine, it was a marvelous meal indeed. Nevertheless, I was rapidly losing my appetite in the face of what I was hearing from my friends. Don't get me wrong, Sovoy said. You've got a great weighty pair on you. I'll never call that into question, but still, he gestured with his spoon. They're going to string you up for this? If he's lucky, Simon said. I mean, we are talking about malfeasance here, aren't we? It's not a big deal, I said with more assurance than I felt. I gave him a little bit of a hot foot, that's all. Any harmful sympathy falls under malfeasance, Manet pointed at me with his piece of bread his wild, grizzled eyebrows arching seriously over his nose. You've got to pick your battles, boy. Keep your head down around the masters. They can make your life a real hell once you get into their bad books. He started it, I said sullenly through a mouthful of beans. A young boy jogged up to the table, breathless. <sighs> your growth, he asked, looking me over. I nodded, my stomach suddenly turning over. They want you in the master's hall. Where is it? I asked. I've only been here a couple of days. Can one of you show him? The boy asked, looking around at the table. I've got to go and tell Jameson I found him. I'll do it, Simon said, pushing away his bowl. I'm not hungry anyway. Jameson's runner boy took off, and Simon started to get to his feet. Hold on, I said, pointing to my tray with my spoon. I'm not finished here. Simon's expression was anxious. I can't believe you're eating, he said. I can't eat. How can you eat? I'm hungry, I said. I don't know what's waiting in the master's hall, but I'm guessing I'd rather have a full stomach for it. You're going on the horns, Manet said. It's the only reason they'd call you there at this time of night. I didn't know what he meant by that, but I didn't want to advertise my ignorance to everyone in the room. They can wait until I'm done. I took another bite of stew. Simon returned to his seat and poked idly at his food. Truth be told, I wasn't really hungry anymore, but it galled me to be pulled away from a meal after all the times I'd been hungry in Tarbin. When Simon and I finally got to our feet, the normal clamor in the mess quieted as folk watched us leave. They knew where I was headed. Outside, Simon put his hands in his pockets and headed roughly in the direction of Hollows. All kidding aside, you're in a good bit of trouble, you know. I was hoping Heme would be embarrassed and keep quiet about it, I admitted. Do they expel many students? I tried to make it sound like a joke. There hasn't been anyone this term, Sim said with his shy, blue-eyed smile. But it's only the second day of classes. You might get some sort of record. This isn't funny, I said, but found myself wearing a grin regardless. Simon could always make me smile, no matter what was going on. Sim led the way, and we reached hollows far too soon for my liking. Simon raised a hand in a hesitant farewell as I opened the door and made my way inside. I was met by Jameson. He oversaw everything that wasn't under direct control of the masters, the kitchens, the laundry, the stables, the stockrooms. He was nervous and bird-like, a man with the body of a sparrow, and the eyes of a hawk. Jameson escorted me into a large windowless room with a familiar crescent-shaped table. The Chancellor sat at the center, as he had during admissions. The only real difference was that this table was not elevated, and the seated masters were close to eye level with me. The eyes I met were not friendly. 
Jameson escorted me to the front of the crescent table. Seeing it from this angle made me understand the references to being on the horns. Jameson retreated to a smaller table of his own, dipping a pen. The Chancellor steepled his fingers and spoke without preamble. On the fourth of Caitlin, Heme called the masters together. Jameson's pen scratched across a piece of paper, occasionally dipping back into the inkwell at the top of the desk. The Chancellor continued formally. Are all the masters present? Master Physica? said Arwill. Master Archivist, said Lauren, his face impassive as ever. Master Arithmetician? Brandia said, cracking his knuckles absently. Master Artificer, grumbled Kilvin, without looking up from the tabletop. Master Alchemist, said Mandrag. Master Rhetorician. Hemi's face was fierce and red. Master Sympathist, said Elksadal. Master Namer. Elodine actually smiled at me. Not just a perfunctory curling of the lips, but a warm, toothy grin. I drew a bit of a shaky breath, relieved that at least one person present didn't seem eager to hang me up by my thumbs. And Master Linguist, said the Chancellor. All eight, he frowned. Sorry, strike that all nine masters are present. Present your grievance, Master Heme. Heme did not hesitate. Today, first-term student Quoth, not of the Arcanum, did perform sympathetic bindings on me with malicious intent. Two grievances are recorded against Quoth by Master Heme, the Chancellor said sternly, not taking his eyes away from me. First grievance, unauthorized use of sympathy. What is the proper discipline for this, Master Archivist? For unauthorized use of sympathy, Leading to injury, the offending student will be bound and whipped a number of times, not less than two nor more than ten, singly across the back, Lauren said as if reading off directions for a recipe. Number of lashes sought? The Chancellor looked at Heme. Heme paused to consider. Five. I felt the blood drain from my face and I forced myself to take a slow, deep breath through my nose to calm myself. Does any master object to this? The Chancellor looked around the table, but all mouths were silent, all eyes were stern. A second grievance, malfeasance, master archivist. Four to fifteen single lashes, and expulsion from the university. Lauren said in a level voice. Lashes sought. Heme stared directly at me. Eight. Thirteen lashes and expulsion. A cold sweat swept over me, and I felt nausea in the pit of my stomach. I had known fear before. In Tarbin it was never far away. Fear kept you alive. But I had never before felt such a desperate helplessness, a fear not just for my body being hurt, but for my entire life being ruined. I began to get lightheaded. Do you understand these grievances set against you? The Chancellor asked sternly. I took a deep breath. Not exactly, sir. I hated the way my voice sounded tremulous and weak. The Chancellor held up a hand, and Jameson lifted his pen from the paper. It is against the laws of the university for a student who is not a member of the Arcanum to use sympathy without permission from a master. His expression darkened. And it is always, always, expressly forbidden to cause harm with sympathy, especially to a master. A few hundred years ago, arcanists were hunted down and burned for things of that sort. We do not tolerate that sort of behavior here. I heard a hard edge creep into the Chancellor's voice. Only then did I sense how truly angry he was. 
He took a deep breath. Now do you understand? I nodded shakily. He made another motion to Jameson, who set his pen back to the paper. Do you, Quoth, understand these grievances set against you? Yes, sir, I said as steadily as I could. Everything seemed too bright, and my legs were trembling slightly. I tried to force them to be still, but it only seemed to make them shake all the more. Do you have anything to say in your defense? The Chancellor asked curtly. I just wanted to leave. I felt the stares of the Masters bearing down on me. My hands were wet and cold. I probably would have shaken my head and slunk from the room had the Chancellor not spoken again. Well, the Chancellor repeated testily, no defense. The words struck a chord in me. They were the same words that Ben had used a hundred times as he drilled me endlessly in argument. His words came back, admonishing me. What? No defense? Any student of mine must be able to defend his ideas against an attack. No matter how you spend your life, your wish will defend you more often than a sword. Keep it sharp. I took another deep breath, closed my eyes, and concentrated. After a long moment, I felt the cool impassivity of the heart of stone surround me. My trembling stopped. I opened my eyes and heard my own voice say, I had permission for my use of sympathy, sir. The Chancellor gave me a long, hard look before saying, What? I held the heart of stone around me like a calming mantle. I had permission from Master Heme, both express and implied. The masters stirred in their seats, puzzled. The Chancellor looked far from pleased. Explain yourself. I approached Master Heme after his first lecture and told him I was already familiar with the concepts he had discussed. He told me we would discuss it the next day. When he arrived for class the next day, he announced that I would be giving the lecture in order to demonstrate the principles of sympathy. After observing what materials were available, I gave the class the first demonstration my master gave me. Not true, of course. As I've already mentioned, my first lesson involved a handful of iron drabs. It was a lie, but a plausible lie. Judging by the master's expressions, this was news to them. Somewhere deep in the heart of stone, I relaxed glad that the master's irritation was based on Heme's angrily abridged version of the truth. You gave a demonstration before the class? The chancellor asked before I could continue. He glanced at Heme, then back to me. I played innocent. Just a simple one, is that unusual? It is a little odd, he said, looking at Heme. I could sense his anger again, but this time it didn't seem to be directed at me. I thought it might be the way you proved your knowledge of the material and moved to a more advanced class, I said innocently, another lie but again plausible. Elk Sadal spoke up. What did the demonstration involve? A wax doll, a hair from Heme's head, and a candle. I would have picked a different example, but my materials were limited. I thought that might be another part of the test, making do with what you were given. I shrugged again. I couldn't think of any other way to demonstrate all three laws with the materials on hand. The Chancellor looked at Heme. Is what the boy says true? Heme opened his mouth as if he would deny it, then apparently remembered that an entire classroom full of students had witnessed the exchange. He said nothing. Damn it, Heme, Elk Sadal burst out. You let the boy make a simulacra of you, then bring him here on malfeasance, he spluttered. You deserve worse than you got. Eller Quoth could not have hurt him with just a candle, Kelvin muttered. He gave his fingers a puzzled look as if he were working something out in his head. Not with hair and wax, maybe blood and clay. Water, the Chancellor's voice was too quiet to be called a shout but it carried the same authority. He shot looks at Elk Sadal and Kilvin. Groth, answer Master Kilvin's question. 
I made a second binding between the candle and a brazier to illustrate the law of conservation. Kilvin didn't look up from his hands. Wax and hair, he grumbled as if not entirely satisfied with my explanation. I gave a half-puzzled, half-embarrassed look and said, I don't understand it myself, sir. I should have got a 10% transference at best. It shouldn't have been enough to blister Master Hemi, let alone burn him. I turned to Hemi. I really didn't mean any harm, sir, I said in my best distraught voice. It was just supposed to be a bit of a hot foot to make you jump. The fire hadn't been going more than five minutes, and I didn't imagine that a fresh fire at 10% could hurt you. I even wrung my hands a little, every bit the distraught student. It was a good performance. My father would have been proud. Well, it did, Heme said bitterly. And where is the damn momet anyway? I demand you return it at once. I I'm afraid I can't, sir. I destroyed it. It was too dangerous to leave lying around. Heme gave me a shrewd look. It's of no real concern, he muttered. The Chancellor took up the reins again. This changes things considerably. Heme, do you still set grievance against Quoth? Heme glared and said nothing. I move to strike both grievances, Arwil said, the physicer's old voice coming as a bit of a surprise. If Heme set him in front of the class, he gave permission, and it isn't malfeasance if you give him your hair and watch him stick it on the momet's head. I expected him to have more control over what he was doing, Heme said, shooting a venomous look at me. It's not malfeasance, Arwil said doggedly, glaring at Heme from behind his spectacles, the grandfatherly lines on his face forming a fierce scowl. It would fall under reckless use of sympathy, Lauren interjected coolly. Is that a motion to strike the previous two grievances and replace them with reckless use of sympathy? Asked the Chancellor, trying to regain a semblance of formality. Aye, said Arwil, still glaring fearsomely at Heme through his spectacles. All for the motion, the Chancellor said. There was a chorus of eyes from everyone but Heme. Against? Heme remained silent. Master Archivist, what is the discipline for reckless use of sympathy? If one is injured by reckless use of sympathy, the offending student will be whipped singly no more than seven times across the back. I wondered what book Master Lauren was reciting from. Number of lashes sought? Heme looked at the other master's faces, realizing the tide had turned against him. My foot is blistered halfway to my knee, he gritted. Three lashes! The Chancellor cleared his throat. Does any master oppose this action? Aye. Aye, Elksadal and Kilvin said together. Who wishes to suspend the discipline? Vote by show of hands. Elksadal, Kilvin, and Arwil raised their hands at once, followed by the Chancellor. Mandrag kept his hand down, as did Lauren, Brandier, and Heme. Elodin grinned at me cheerily, but did not raise his hand. I kicked myself for my recent trip to the archives and the bad impression it made on Lauren. If not for that, he might have tipped things in my favor. Four and a half in favor of suspending punishment, the Chancellor said after a pause. The discipline stands. Three lashes to be served tomorrow, the fifth of Caitlin, at noon. As I was deep into the heart of stone, all I felt was a slight analytical curiosity about what it would be like to be publicly whipped. All the masters showed signs of preparing to stand and leave, but before things could be called to a close, I spoke up. Chancellor? He took a deep breath and let it out in a gush. Yes. During my admission, you said that my admittance to the Arcanum was granted contingent upon proof that I had mastered the basic principles of sympathy. I quoted him nearly word for word. Does this constitute proof? Both Heme and the Chancellor opened their mouths to say something. Heme was louder. Look here, you little cocker! Heme! The Chancellor snapped. 
Then he turned to me. I am afraid proof of mastery requires more than a simple sympathetic binding. A double binding, Kilvin corrected gruffly. Elodine spoke, seeming to startle everyone at the table. I can think of students currently enrolled in the Arcanum who would be hard-pressed to complete a double binding, let alone draw enough heat to blister a man's foot to the knee. I'd forgotten how Elodin's light voice moved through the deep places in your chest when he spoke. He smiled happily at me again. There was a moment of quiet reflection. True enough, admitted Elksadal, giving me a close look. The Chancellor looked down at the empty table for a minute. Then he shrugged, looked up, and gave a surprisingly jaunty smile. All in favor of admitting first-term student Quoth's reckless use of sympathy as proof of mastery of the basic principles of sympathy, vote by show of hands. Kilvin and Elksadal raised their hands together. Arwil added his a moment later. Elodin waved. After a pause, the Chancellor raised his hand as well, saying, Five and a half in favor of Quoth's admission to the Arcanum. Motion passed, meeting dismissed, Telu shelter us, fools and children all. He said the last very softly, as he rested his forehead against the heel of his hand. Heme stormed out of the room with Brandia in tow. Once they were through the door, I heard Brandia ask, Weren't you wearing a gram? No, I wasn't. Heme snapped, and don't take that tone with me as if this were my fault. You might as well blame someone stabbed in an alley for not wearing armor. We should all take precautions, Brander said placatingly. You know as well as- Their voices were cut off with the sound of a door closing. Kilvin stood and shrugged his shoulders, stretching. Looking over to where I stood, he scratched his bushy beard with both hands, a thoughtful look on his face, then strode over to where I stood. Do you have your segaldry yet, Elliot Quoth? I looked at him blankly. Do you mean runes, sir? I'm afraid not. Kelvin ran his hands through his beard thoughtfully. Do not bother with the basic artificing class you have signed for. Instead, you will come to my workroom tomorrow, noon. I'm afraid I have another appointment at noon, Master Kelvin. Hmm, yes he frowned. First bell, then. I'm afraid the boy will be having an appointment with my folk shortly after the whipping, Kilvin, Arwil said, with a glimmer of amusement in his eyes. Have someone bring you to the medica afterwards, son. We'll stitch you back together. Thank you, sir. Arwil nodded and made his way out of the room. Kilvin watched him go, then turned to look at me. My workshop, day after tomorrow, noon. The tone of his voice implied that it wasn't really a question. I would be honored, Master Kilvin. He grunted in response and left with Elksadar. That left me alone with the still-seated Chancellor. We stared at each other while the sound of footsteps faded in the hallway. I brought myself back up out of the heart of stone and felt a tangle of anticipation and fear at everything that had just happened. I'm sorry to be so much trouble so soon, sir, I offered hesitantly. Oh? he said, his expression considerably less stern now that we were alone. How long had you intended to wait? At least a span, sir. My brush with disaster had left me feeling giddy with relief. I felt an irrepressible grin bubble onto my face. At least a span, he muttered. The Chancellor put his face into his hands and rubbed, then looked up and surprised me with a wry smile. I realized he wasn't particularly old when his face wasn't locked in a stern expression, probably only on the far side of forty. You don't look like someone who knows he's going to be whipped tomorrow, he observed. I pushed the thought aside. I imagine I'll heal, sir. He gave me an odd look. It took me a while to recognize it as the one I'd grown accustomed to in the troop. He opened his mouth to speak, but I jumped on the words before he could say them. I'm not as young as I look, sir, I know it. I just wish other people knew it, too. I imagine they will before too long. 
he gave me a long look before pushing himself up from the table. He held out a hand. Welcome to the Arcanum. I shook his hand solemnly, and we parted ways.